Brandlin with the puck. Brandlin trying to fight off a check as he plays to the point. Instead, he works his way back free. Brandlin fires, scores! Breaks a tackle at the 25. Breaks another at the 30. And he's loose! Adrian's inside the 30. 20, 10, touchdown! And hello, everybody. Welcome to Dormcast. This is going to be the first episode of Dormcast, so I want to thank you all first for tuning in. It means a lot to me. Um, yeah, if you guys have any comments throughout the show or whatever, just leave them down below. But, I mean, I guess I'm just going to start by uh, getting into it right now. I'm going to just kind of jump in. This podcast is just going to be by me today. I'm not having any guests on. Uh, I didn't ask any Twitter questions or anything. I kind of just want to set the tone for how this podcast is going to be laid out. And obviously it can change and evolve and all that. But right now, uh, yeah, I'm just going to be talking about Minnesota sports mainly. Uh, this is going to be an introductory Minnesota sort of cast. I may obviously go off on a little bit of tangents of some guys, and I'm actually going to... I play weekly fantasy leagues, so right now I mainly do FanDuel. So I'm going to do a little bit of an, an analysis of some guys I think you guys should play for cheap. Um, and I'm going to try to include timestamps in the description of this video. So that means like if you want to skip to the part where I talk about the Wild or the Vikings defense or even the Timberwolves a little bit, or the FanDuel bit, uh, definitely I will leave that down below so you can look in the description and just click on the time, it'll send you right there. Very easy for you, very easy for me, and I think it really just helps everyone involved, pretty much. <laughs> Alright, so basically, uh, let's start off with what I wanted to start here, and that's going to be uh, the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, the Vikings here are sitting at a, pr a pretty good place, I would say. You know, we're, we're, we have a winning record right now. Uh, we we won a game out of the bye, and now we have a good stretch of games against winnable opponents like the Lions and the Bears. I believe we play Oakland. Um, Oakland will be a fun game. I'm really excited to see Derek Carr against Teddy Bridgewater. I think they're both really good quarterbacks in their own aspects. I think Teddy's more of a system guy who, who in in a good way, not like a Christian Ponder system guy, but like a system guy that works. Um, and I believe Carr is sort of will be the leader of that team with Amari Cooper and hopefully Latavius Murray if he can sort of fix his fumbling issues for a long time to come, honestly. Um, I th but I think, yeah, Teddy sort of, he'll get his accolades, and I, I guess he could be that sort of leader, but I still think Teddy's meant to be a system quarterback, but in the best way. He, he's, he's really good at it, and there's plenty of quarterbacks who are system quarterbacks who are very successful in the uh, in the NFL like I mean I'm trying to think of some guys off the top of my head and it's not exactly coming to me but I mean even one could argue that Drew Brees sort of works in the system even though he has had success in multiple teams I'm just kinda saying that so you get a sense of what I mean by a system quarterback so some quarterbacks only work or they choose to work within the system and the team as a whole succeeds and some quarterbacks are just very talented and their team isn't as good around them and they have to I would say um, well I think Aaron Rodgers coming into the NFL was not a system guy or he was a system guy I, I should say but now he's evolved out of that which is not something that can usually happen just how talented he is um, but going back to what I want to start with on the Vikings that's gonna be Teddy Bridgewater um, and I want to know what you guys think of Teddy's season I want to say right now that I, I think it's solid. I think there's a lot more he could be doing, um, but I realize there are a lot of factors into why he's not succeeding. Injuries is a big one, obviously, um, but I'm going to get to that after I sort of talk about his stats in general. So uh, it's, in it's interesting when you look at the stats last year because he had a pretty good season. Um, one could say he had almost 3,000 yards. Um, he had a completion percentage of 64%. Uh, you know, he had 14 touchdowns, 12 interceptions. A very average, very good season, and he ended it with a string of games where he was throwing for 300, 200 yards, multi-touchdowns. And the key in those games, though, that people don't realize is he did throw some interceptions. Now, I realize some of them were... Uh, there was a couple that were at the end of the half, a couple that were receiver's fault, um, and that happens with a young quarterback. So I'm just saying that Teddy can throw interceptions even though he is so accurate. Um, anyway, so those last four games were interesting because the Jets was the big one in overtime. 
Um, and this this stat was a little bit inflated because he did have the very long game-winning screen pass to Jerry's right. But he threw for 300 yards, um, a completion percentage of over 70%, two touchdowns and a pick. Next week against the Lions that we lost, he still threw for 300 yards and a touchdown, two interceptions. That Miami game, which I th I think that Miami game might be his best game as a pro, uh, where he, he threw... For 259 yards, a 73.1 completion percentage, two touchdowns, and a pick. That was just, for me, that was just a great game. The pass that he threw to Greg Jennings, if you don't remember, was spectacular, to be honest. So, last season, I think Teddy had a very strong rookie season. And I'm wondering, did you guys expect more from him going into the season? Because I don't know if I if I did. And, and that's the thing, because... I don't think we're meant to see an inflation of those statistics at that point. I think, I mean, there's some things he can improve on those stats. Um, but I think that's, I mean, almost a good baseline of what we'll see from Teddy for the next few years until he can reach that n next upper echelon if he does get there, which I believe he does at some point. Um, the thing I'm seeing with Teddy this year is he's much more aware in the pocket. He does not seem to struggle on the deep ball at all. Um... And the, and the main issue is that he doesn't have a guy right now that's his go-to guy. And that's when Teddy Bridgewater succeeds. Because in college, it was Devontae Parker. Last year, it was Greg Jennings. And that is one of the most underrated aspects of this Vikings team, is our loss of Greg Jennings. Everyone assumed, we brought in Mike Wallace, he's a more talented wide receiver, which granted, he is. I don't think Greg would still be getting the same production, but if there is a guy that... Teddy needed to complete a pass to on third down. It was Greg Jennings, always. And I don't know the statistics behind that, but you guys knew watching games, if Teddy was in trouble, even if he, even if the pass was not going to be completed, we almost always saw him throw in the direction of Greg. I'm pretty sure Greg Jennings caught Teddy Bridgewater's first pass, and that is something that, that people don't talk about enough. Like, that immediate connection with quarterback and wide receiver, it's, it's big. And Greg Jennings was a great receiver for us. Um, I don't think he's doing anything with the Dolphins, which is really sad. And I hope he's helping Devontae Parker and Kenny Stills and Jarvis Landry down there. They have a good receiving core. Um, that team's a mess, though, and I'm definitely not going to get into a tangent on that. The thing with Teddy, though, is, is I'm, like I said, I'm seeing the little improvements. I'm seeing better pocket awareness. I'm seeing him throw the ball away more, usually. Um, he seems to be running it a bit better when he needs to, sliding very well. He's had a couple games where he's run for over, you know, 20 yards on a few attempts. That's solid. I'll definitely take that, and that's probably reduced because of some of the sacks that he takes or where he's forced to run out. Um, but we look at, uh, like, let's let's take a step back and look at our best games as a team, being the Vikings. Um, Detroit, obviously, our first win, 26-16 win, which was not as close as the score says, 14 of 18. Uh, that is a 77.8% completion percentage. He only threw for 153 yards, but he did throw for a touchdown, no pick. That was a QB rating, 98.5, which, um, or that, yeah, yeah. I, I get confused about the two ratings. It, it's like the one that's like out of 100, I feel like, is like he got a 98.5, and then the next higher one, he got 120. I don't know exactly how that works, but he also, in that game, I forgot, he had six attempts running with 21 yards, and he also ran in a touchdown. So that was a multi-touchdown game. Um, and then the next week against San Diego, which was a solid game from Teddy. He did throw a pick, but we need to remember the pass before that interception. The interception was when he threw deep left end zone to Charles Johnson. The pass before that was a very beautiful, like, just a dime that he, he dropped right into Kyle Rudolph's hands in the end zone, and Kyle just dropped it. He, he did not secure the ball. I don't know what Kyle was doing there. Um, but yeah, so that game statistically should have been much better for Teddy, uh, but it definitely wasn't. And I think his best game this season um, has been the Denver game. He started sort of slow, but he finished very strong, especially the way that O-line was working. He figured out, oh my god, this offensive line cannot block guys like DeMarcus Ware, who was just coming off um, an AFC Player of the Month award or Von Miller, who is a elite Pro Bowl um, defender. And, yeah, I mean, that defense is very good. And so that our offensive line could not hold up, and honestly, I don't blame him for that game. 
But Teddy progressed through that game, and that's what makes me excited about him as a quarterback. Most quarterbacks, or I would say, yeah, the majority of them, whenever the game is not going their way, they they will start to panic, and their, their production will actually decrease. Um, but with Teddy Bridgewater, if he struggles in the beginning of the games, I actually see his progress get better because I think he becomes more focused. He, he just goes into that mode where he does not think. He only reacts, and that's where I think Teddy Bridgewater can really succeed. And anyway, this game, yeah, 27 of 41. He threw 41 passes, which is... I'm wondering if that's the most passes he's thrown in a, in a game. Uh, no, he threw 42 in the Tampa Bay game. That did go into overtime, but I don't think we got an offensive snap because that was the game bar for the touchdown. Yeah, so that's the second most passes that Teddy's thrown. Oh, he also threw for 41 against the Lions last year. So he, he's he been up in the 40s a couple times, which is interesting. Um, and that, uh, that Denver game, yeah, Adrian was having trouble running until he broke the one on fourth and one. So, I mean, it, it, Teddy really stepped up in that game. And I really thought he was going to lead that drive. And had we been able to secure TJ Ward, had... Just had our line been able to block a little bit better, had we been able to get a running back who could actually get a good block, I think Teddy could have let us down for the touchdown drive. And um, yeah, I mean that was one of his best games against an elite defense. He did not throw an interception, which I think is amazing. I think he had a couple close ones, but the fact is he he didn't throw one. That was great. Um, then going back to the Kansas City game yesterday, or not yesterday, I, I should say last week. Um, I would say Teddy had a solid performance. Um, nothing spectacular, but he did throw for second most yardage of this year, 249, threw for a touchdown. Um, he had the two interceptions, which were a little bit rough, obviously. But I would say this was a solid game for Teddy, considering that Adrian was completely locked down. Teddy to, Teddy's passing was about the only option we had in that game. And I think the main issue that we're having this year with Teddy Bridgewater is that his receivers are not getting any sense of separation. Like, none. Charles Johnson has proven that he cannot create separation at the wide receiver position at this point, and I have no idea what's happening there. Because he's supposed to be Norv Turner's guy, the guy that he uh, he taught kind of personally, him and his son. Um, are, like, he's their secret find, he's our secret receiver that was supposed to finally take that jump this year, and he is not. He has not been able to create um, any separation. He's not fast enough to run past every corner, and people know his skill set at this point. That scares me. Uh, Mike Wallace can only really create separation on streak routes or screens. He is not known for the middle of the field type running. I don't think he, he likes catching those types of passes. And so... And I'm all right with that. I'm all right with our number one receiver being a kind of a streak guy who can go and get the big ball. But we need receivers who are, are then confident in their routes and then confident in creating separation following that. Jarius Wright doesn't work that way either. Jarius Wright is a guy who does take slants over the middle, but not one that creates separation on the outside or in any other aspects of the game. The only receiver I've seen this year that is able to create significant separation so far is Stephon Diggs. And I'm pumping the brakes on Diggs a little bit. Mike Wallace compared him to Antonio Brown, like a mini Antonio Brown. I would never go that that way, because that, that only creates so much pressure for the young guy. Um, but he was, a, I believe, a 4 or 5 star recruit coming out of high school. And then just because of injury and kind of bad quarterback play, I don't know how he wound up at Maryland, I believe it was, in the first place. But that's where he chose, or I guess maybe that was one of the only places that offered. But... That's where he wound up. I think he might have had some off-the-field issues. I'm not 100% sure on that, so please don't quote me on that one. But Stefan Diggs have been, has been able to create separation, not only in general, but off two of my favorite corners this year. <laughs> or I, I should say three, because I believe he did play against Chris Harris, too. But mainly, Aqib Tlaib, who is having himself a monster year. A big corner who is fast, who has amazing recovery speed, and who does not let anyone break out routes. That out route that he had against Aqib Tlaib, I mean, Aqib was turned the opposite way. That is just very good head movement, very good feet movement, and just solid route running. Stefan knew where he needed to be, and he was there, and he creates separation, and Teddy threw a great pass. 
that's how <laughs> that's how the NFL works. That's how football works, and we need that. We can't always have guys who are saying how fast they are, how strong they are, how they can catch all these touchdowns. We need guys who are gritty, who know how to run routes. That's the problem with Cordell Patterson, is he doesn't run a route. He doesn't know how to run routes. I don't think he cares. People tell him to run a 10-yard curl. He runs an 11, a 12, a 9. The whole play is messed up. That's the way the NFL works. You need to be in the right position. By I-, I mean, people call it a game of inches in multiple ways. It applies here. It is definitely a game of inches in this case. Because, like, if you're in just the wrong spot, the quarterback can throw the ball just an inch. Like, that's the trouble that I hate when people criticize quarterbacks so much. Because you never know. Their wide receiver could have been even an inch to the left, to the right, upfield, back towards the quarterback, and the whole play was messed up, and there could have been an interception. And, yeah, I just think that is absolutely... Well, I'm, I've been getting off on a lot of tangents here. Going back, I think Stefan Diggs is that guy who can create separation, and that means he needs to be our number two wide receiver. And that is where it gets a little bit messy, because then who is the slot guy? Who's the number two guy? Charles Johnson doesn't play in the slot. He's an outside receiver. So is it Jarius then still, or should Stefan play in the slot, and should Charles get more reps outside? I think it's too early to abandon ship on Charles Johnson, but he hasn't shown us anything, and that scares me. It, it, he hasn't gone after contested balls, and you look at his big plays last year, he was wide open, and I think it's because people didn't know who he was. Now people, I mean, everyone was saying he's our number one wide receiver. He got himself a good card on Madden, <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden people are treating him like the number one wide receiver, and he has not been able to put up to his end of the deal in that case. So, I mean, I think Stefan Diggs, either way, needs more playing time. I think all Vikings fans can agree on that. However, I think we do need to pump the brakes on him. It's very important to realize that teams don't have a lot of tape on him. They have college tape, but that's also college tape that's marred with injuries and, like I said, bad quarterback play. So, his skill set might not have been showcased as well. I've seen some of his tapes, and we can see his skill, but I mean, he, now there's only, like, two teams that people can watch to see game NFL game film of him. Like, he's only played, basically, in two games. So, there still will be a few weeks here where teams don't know what to expect from Diggs, and he'll get those chances. But then after that, people are going to start keying on him. And that's where he needs to prove that he can be that wide receiver. And I, I think he has the skills. I think he has the drive and the ability to do so. That he needs to get that mental aspect that Cordell never got. He can't get too full of himself now before teams find out about him, because then if he does, just like Cordero, he will rely way too much on the things that got him success in the beginning and never develop things on how to continue success. And that's how it works in the NFL. You cannot just rely on your initial success. You always need to improve, whether it's mentally, physically, or or just... I mean, yeah, basically mentally or physically are the two ways. You always need to improve, and that's the case here where Stephon Diggs needs to take just a step back and realize that he has all the skill sets to be everything you want to a wide receiver. And that's where he just he needs to keep learning, and I, I think he has the ability. So, I mean, Stephon Diggs, again, just a great guy um, and just a great player so far. Uh, moving on to a little bit more of the offense, I want to talk about our offensive line. Now, everybody is very quick to criticize the offensive line. I am too. Our offensive line has struggled immensely this year. But the problems are not what you would exactly suspect. You look at our two biggest losses. That would be John Sullivan and Phil Lothold. We know Clemmings is struggling filling in for Lothold. But we need to remember he is a rookie player who is coming off a very bad injury. And it doesn't seem to be affecting him. But I bet mentally it probably is. <sighs> I had to get some water there. <laughs> but mentally, it it has to be affecting him, you would think, right? Th- I mean, any big injury like that, I just can't imagine playing through that without it in the back of your mind. Now, players can definitely get over that, I think. Obviously, I mean, we've seen it all the time. But I think that, plus the fact that I don't think he expected to play, that's where the mental really comes in. I, I think he... He knew he wouldn't be a first-round player like he was predicted before the injury and all that. Um, even after the injury, he was thought. But I think he 
he realized he would be able to sit and then prove his talent. And I think that's what we all thought. But with Lord Holt going down, he had to, I mean, he had to step up. And he's, he's shown flashes of being a great player, but he's also shown flashes of not knowing where he is. There was a play against Kansas City, I want to say, where he just went for a, a chop block and completely whiffed on it, and Teddy got hit. So that, that type of thing cannot happen if you want to be a starting tackle. So I think there's definitely room to improve there. The real issue that I'm sort of taking up is with our guard play. Um, I was wary when we switched Brandon Fusco, who was a very, I, I wanted to just say top five right guard before his injury, pride of Slippery Rock College, I believe the only player in the NFL from Slippery Rock. Um, and, and he was a top guard, but then he got hurt and he had to recover from that and also make a position change to the left guard. And it just frustrated frustrated me so much that we, we couldn't find a left guard in free agency. We couldn't pursue, and I know guys like Evan Mathis, I don't know if he would have came here and with the price tag. And I don't know, I don't know. It just It's frustrating to see Fusco, who is so good at the right guard position, now struggle at the left guard. And then Mike Harris, who, I, again, it's hard to blame Mike Harris because he was training to be a right tackle. That was where he was going to be. He was going to start at tackle, and he had a very good preseason at, at tackle. And um, so now that he's been forced to play guard, he struggled a lot. And those two guard spots, if they fail, that's definitely, um, I mean, that's just, if the two guard spots fail, then the whole offensive line basically crumbles. But if I'm going to be talking about failures, I need to talk about successes as well. We need to talk about how good of a season Matt Khalil is having. Right now, Matt Khalil is looking like the player we drafted him to be, a franchise left tackle. Have you seen how many times Teddy has gotten hit by his blind side? It's not a lot. He's had pressure from the left side, but I think that's due to Fusco. I don't think Fusco and Khalil have gelled. But <laughs> I'm going to give you a statistic here. I don't know how much you guys like statistics or how much you like pro football focus. Don't tell Coach Zimmer I was here on this website. <laughs> but he might like this one. I'm going to name off the 10 best sackless streaks among left tackles. So this is obviously which left tackles have gone the longest without giving up a sack. Number 10, Andrew Whitworth, Cincinnati. Elite. He's got 819 snaps without it. Debrickishaw Ferguson, veteran from the Jets, 563. Will Beatty from the Giants, again veteran, 362. Tyron Smith, basically top two. I would say him and Jason Peters, the two best left tackles. Whitworth's up there, too. Tyron Smith with 352. Number five, Matt Khalil. 313 snaps without allowing a sack. That is really good. And I just mentioned Jason Peters. It's been 232 since Jason Peters has done it. So Khalil has been almost 100 snaps <laughs> more since giving up a sack. And that's above guys like Trent Williams, Sebastian Vollmer for New England, Roger Saffold is solid. Teron Armstead, um, I believe is injured right now, but was, is great for New Orleans. One second. So, I mean, I'm trying to see if, I mean, he's not top 10 all time there to like, but I mean, if he can keep playing to that level, that's exactly what we want. And I don't have any, any other statistics, but Pro Football Focus has been ranking him consistently as one of the top tackles this season, and we need to acknowledge that as fans because we really fucked up in how we treated Khalil last year. And I know some fans will be like, oh, this is what lit a fire under his ass, you know? I don't think so. I think Matt Khalil, and I know in the NFL you need to deal with this stuff, but people were, like, attacking him after games. I mean, what kind of Vikings fan behavior is that? The guy was obviously injured throughout the season, and his whole mental game was thrown off. And to see him succeed like this, we should be giving him so much credit. Because he's not only improved physically, he's not only rehabbed very well, he's not only improved his play on the field, he has handled that mental game well, and he has not brought up last season in how we treated him in any way since then. I think that is just, I think that's spectacular. And you have to love the guy for it. And I'm not saying to put all your trust back in him, like we did his his rookie season. Okay, I know he can still struggle, that happens with tackles, and it's still early in the season, but I just, uh, Khalil is having a great season, and I'm tired of Vikings fans not acknowledging it, 
They see our offensive line looking bad, and they're like, oh, that's Khalil again. No, it's not Matt Khalil. Matt Khalil is an elite pass blocker, and I'm, I'm confident in saying that. He is one of the better pass blocking left tackles in the NFL right now with how he's playing. I'm not exactly saying skill-wise, but pass blocking alone, he's got it. Okay, he's got that franchise left tackle ability. Run blocking, he struggles a little bit. And I don't know the statistics. Maybe I'm wrong here. But just from an eye test, he looks like he struggles. But some left tackles are just not that good at run blocking, and they're still very good. Um, I would say, I don't know any off the top of my head off this, this top list, but I would say Sebastian Vollmer is not that great of a run blocking left tackle. Um, meanwhile, guys like Teron Armstead are better than are better run blockers, I say, than than pass blockers. Teron Armstead is fast, guys. <laughs> um, but yeah, so people need to. I just want you guys to know Matt Khalil is having a great season, and it's definitely not his fault that our offensive line has been struggling. So I, I guess that's sort of rant over on that end. Um, I already talked about the loss of Sully and. Okay, I want to ask you guys, do you guys, th and we talked about receivers, so I'm going to keep this short, but do you think that, um, do you think Mike Wallace works here? I'm still very unsure, because I like Mike Wallace. I like Mike Wallace more than people. People call him a run, or a, <laughs> a one-trick pony. I don't think so. I think Mike Wallace has all the skills to become a very, very good wide receiver. He knows how to catch touchdowns. He knows how to get open on streaks. And he is fast as hell. But I don't know if he works in the system. And that kind of scares me. He seems like a guy that Spielman was like, walked up to Zimmer and was like, I got us Mike Wallace. And Mu and Zimmer and Norv were like, okay. And and it's interesting because this Norv Turner offense that he has, there, has here is not the Norv Turner offense that I expected. And maybe that's just because he doesn't have the personnel and he's trying to, but maybe it was just me. I really expected his San Diego personnel. You know, turn Adrian into a Ladanian, um, get a good wide receiver like Vincent Jackson. I, I really thought Charles Johnson could be like Malcolm Floyd. And so far it just hasn't exactly panned out. And uh, I don't know. I go back and forth because I really like Norv as a coordinator, but I'm also very curious what he's doing with guys like Mike Wallace. Is it Mike Wallace's fault that he's not succeeding? Is it because plays aren't going his way? Is it because Teddy and him don't have a connection? That's the questions that I want you guys to answer more than me. Do you think Mike Wallace is a fit here? Should we be concerned? Or do you think he's actually having a solid season? Because he's not doing poorly. I would say last week against Kansas City, he had a bad game. He, he dropped a few balls. He did not get the yardage everyone expects. Stephon Diggs stole the show. But he has had a few games, good games. I want to say the Denver game was very good. Uh, but we haven't seen that big deep ball since in the preseason. Since that one preseason pass to the right sideline against Dallas, we have not seen a very big deep connection. We've seen it with Jarius Rice, or Jarius Wright, I should say. We've seen it with Diggs, I think, on a couple long routes. But... I don't think we've seen it with our best deep threat wide receiver, and that, that kind of scares me. So I'm curious what you guys have to think. And then I already talked about the wide receivers after him. I didn't mention Adam Thielen, but I do like Adam Thielen, so shout out to you, man. Um, oh, Also, I guess apparently Cordell Patterson is also on the trading block since Gerald Hodges was, because um, we did end up trading Hodges. But it seems like well, I, b I bet we're probably asking too much for Cordell, because still, we're still throwing around that old first-round pick. Look at his rookie year. He was like third in most rookie of the year votings I would say or he was up there with Lacey um, so come on take him take him he's still got all the potential but we're we're not going to get much for him I mean you look at I think we traded a fourth round pick for Mike Wallace Cordero is nothing near that so um, w people are always saying trade Cordero what are we doing well you're not going to get anything for trading him so I mean he's still an electric kick returner and so I think he's just going to take up a roster spot be active in that sense for a while until uh, until he gets out of here. I think the Cordero Patterson hype is sadly sort of over, just because he's shown no no progression, and that really makes me mad. Because my, I mean, I love Cordero. My friend Adam and I, who by the way, actually just texted me that he's going to the Wild Game tonight, which is awesome. So shout out to you, Adam. Uh, he, well, I'm going to try to get Adam on a couple podcasts because we, I mean, 
we drove to school together and we always talked about sports all the time and we had a few classes together which we probably talked about sports more than we did the actual class <laughs> so I mean you guys know how that stuff works but um, where was it going oh yeah we loved Cordero Patterson you know we we called him Flash like everyone did and uh, he was just someone we could always talk about a good guy off the field that's that's the thing that makes me mad. Is he off the field? He says all the right things. He's not cocky off the field in a sense. He's nice. He helps out the community. Then on the field, it's just like he doesn't learn. And that might just be him, and it's annoying. But, okay. So we've been talking about the Vikings offense for a while. I do want to move on to the defense here quickly um, and then get into some talk about the Wild because I don't want this to be just a Vikings podcast. And, I mean, I've been talking about the Vikings in general, so I'm going to mention a few guys. We, as Vikings fans, have known it forever. <laughs> I mean, not forever, but for a long time. Um, but Harrison Harrison Smith is a top safety in the league. I think he is the best safety in the league right now. Um, just because I feel like Cam Chancellor has the best instincts in a way, but um, Harrison Smith is just the best combination of coverage, run playing, pass rushing, play recognition, hard hitting, and intercepting that there is. He, he has everything you want from him in a safety. He also has size. Um, I mean, speed, he's pretty fast. And you guys see the hits. Like, I think his best hit is the one against Colin Kaepernick. Um, even though Ka- Kaepernick bounced back up, that was a monster hit. <sighs> Getting a bit of water there. Um, but yeah, that was a great hit. And Harrison is just everything you want in a safety. So this is for any of my fans that... Or people, and I shouldn't say, what am I saying, my fans? Any of the people that are tuning into the podcast who are not fans of the Minnesota Vikings. Um, Harrison Smith has been now consistently ranked um, on Pro Football Focus as one of the top safeties in the league. I think, no, he's been ranked as the top safety in the league for a few weeks now. And it just shows because he that's how he plays. And that's how good he is as a player, so... Really, you guys, whatever whatever team you like, look up Harrison Smith highlights. Watch the guy play. He does everything you want. He's able to start at the line of scrimmage, pass rush, pass rush, back up, play the pass, play a linebacker role. He can do all that stuff. He's big. He can hit. He, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. So Harrison, um, and then and then moving on. So our pair of rookies had a very good game last last week, and I just want to get a quick mention. Eric Kendricks has been a tackling machine. He's only had a couple missed tackles that I think we've all seen a, a few ones where he hasn't taken the right angle. But he's a tackling machine. He, um, I haven't seen him much in pass coverage, so I don't know how he's been there. But I just every time there's a ball thrown or or run, he's always around the ball. He's one of those swarming players, which I can't think of a comparison. I mean, um, he's definitely not up to this guy in skill level, but Ray Lewis was someone who I always saw around the ball when it happened. And I'd like to think Kendricks is that same type of player. That might be a very bad comparison, though. Um, yeah, he had a plus 2.6 from pro, pro Football Focus in that Kansas City game. Um, and then also I want to bring up Daniil Hunter, who had a very strong game coming off the edge. And I think Daniil Hunter has all the ability to be one of the most freakish, athletic pass rushers in the NFL. He is fast, he's strong, he's big, and he's young. <laughs> and that is the perfect combination. At LSU, he would just kill guys. But that's the issue with him so far in the NFL, is that since in college he could just run around guys or power through them, he tries to do that in the NFL. And you can see him working on trying to develop pass rush moves, but it, when he see, it seems when he gets in games or key situations, he just reverts back to his old self. And that's that's the problem with pass rushers transitioning into the NFL, is you need you need them to develop moves otherwise they won't be able to get around uh pro bowl left tackles who have been in the game for five to ten years so he doesn't have that yet but he had he had a strong game he had the forced fumble which (laughs) was really kind of the kansas city offensive lineman punched the ball out but i mean hey you never know hunter kind of drove him into him and yeah um and then there's three more guys i want to mention Okay, so Sharif Floyd, I think, is finally, I want to say, finally again emerging as the defensive tackle that we all knew he could be. Sharif Floyd is dominant skill-wise. When in that draft that we drafted him, people were expecting him to go top 5 and, like, top 10 at the least. We got him somewhere around the, like, 20th pick. And I thought, what is steal? And (laughs) he's had troubles transitioning his game into the defensive tackle 
position in the NFL. But right now, I just see him sometimes he'll just throw a center aside and just bull rush the guy. It just I mean, I've seen him do so many moves on players. That he's just a fun player to watch. Okay, he had um, in the Kansas City game, he had, let's see, where is it? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, he had a sack, a hit, and four hurries on 31 rushes. He beat Grubbs on four pressures. Yeah, Ben Grubbs is a very good offensive guard, too. And there we go. Okay, I was making sure this was on here before I said it. But yeah, he did bust out a spin move that worked on Grubbs. Um, and the right guard, Zach Fulton. So yeah, he can do spin moves and bull rush moves from the defensive tackle position. That's an athletic freak that we see in guys like Kevin Williams and John Randall. Again, I'm not saying he's playing to their level yet. But sort of that next great um, defensive tackle for the Minnesota Vikings. I think that Sharif Floyd can be that guy to be honest. So, um, yeah, breaking into the next guy, I think Xavier Rhodes is what I want to talk about. I want to send a question your way. Do you think Xavier Rhodes is having a good season? Because I think it's interesting because his name hasn't been called much. And is, is that a good thing? You, you, I mean, almost, yeah, you don't want to hear from your corners a lot because that usually makes their, <laughs> means they're making a mistake. But, uh, I don't know. It seems like he's been average. I, I'm expecting him to take that next step into be an elite, nationally recognized corner, and I just haven't seen him take that step yet. So, I mean, he hasn't done anything to make me criticize him, but I think we should keep watching him and seeing how is he performing, because there are some cornerbacks, one specifically, on this team that are showing that they are the flashy guy who's making all the plays, and that would be Captain Munnerlyn. Captain Munderland is having such a good season, and people need to talk about that. When he was brought here last year from Carolina, he was expected to be our number one wide receiver, and he failed. He did not play good last year. His size really showed, his speed looked lacking, and he couldn't make a lot of tackles. This year, though, he's looking like the resurgence of Antoine Winfield. He is making tackles in the run game, he is getting tons of pass deflections, and he's just swarming the ball. So, I mean, people need to, to look at what he's doing, Captain Munnerland, and realize that he deserves recognition. So, I mean, I'm not going to clap for him right now because it's just me. That would be a little bit weird. But, um, yeah, he's been great. So, that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about for the Vikings. I realize that has been a, a very large por portion of the podcast. We're here about 37 minutes. Um, obviously, you can skip to the next part or what I'm about to talk about through those timestamps. <laughs> Um, but you probably did that already if you wanted to. Um, so moving away from the Vikings, I'm going to be talking about Minnesota Wild. I'm a huge fan of the Minnesota Wild, and I wanted to say that the start of this season overall has been very good. I mean, we're 4-1-1. One one. Um, obviously, the overtime loss, only one regulation loss, which was to the Ducks, and I know the Ducks have been struggling, but because I guess wow they are at the bottom of their division but this early in the season I mean the Ducks are going to make the playoffs I think that's that seems easy to say right I mean I don't think I'm crazy in saying that who else do they have in that division they have the Kings Sharks Canucks and that's about it oh Calgary too Calgary's having a bad start to the season I don't think the Oilers are going to the playoffs and I don't think the Coyotes are either or Coyotes whatever however you say it um but Overall, I'm happy with the Minnesota Wild, but the, I'm going to be talking about some things that I think can either be improved or that we should stop yelling about. Because Minnesota Wild fans are, I think, even worse than Minnesota Vikings fans at always calling out the team's flaws. We get pissed off at the smallest things, and I do too. But I need to tell you guys, I'm telling you all, as Minnesota fans, calm down on Devin Dubnik. I don't mean calm down in saying that, like, like I did with Stefan Diggs. I'm saying you guys need to calm down on criticizing him the way you are. I don't care. I don't care if he's not playing to your standard. I don't care if his stats are not amazing. You cannot judge a goaltender like this who is still getting used to... I mean, I know he played a lot of this, but he's still getting used to his new role right now, okay? With, new, with a whole new team in front of him. Teams change in the NHL, and even though ours, there wasn't a lot of changing, like... <laughs> goaltenders usually struggle to start the season unless they're at that super elite level and that's what's been happening with Devin but you cannot criticize him when he's I don't think you can when he's 4-1 okay he's been winning us games 
and the most underrated factor I think when it comes to the to hockey is how a team plays for their goaltender and the way that this team plays for Dubnik shows that he should be our starting goaltender and that he was worth the money that he has am I willing to revisit this and admit my mistake yes because I think it's way too early to judge him either way but right now, I see a team playing for Devin Dubnik every night. Okay? I see a team that is going out there and scoring after Dubnik lets up one. Or scoring after Dubnik makes a big save. Okay, I, s I see Parisi specifically really playing for that team. Uh, sorry if you guys just heard, like, a scream, by the way. Again, I'm in a dorm, so people are a little weird here. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I people play for Devin Dubik, and that's, I think, the issue with Darcy Kemper, too. Darcy had a very good game, and a game we should have won in overtime or in regulation, but I don't think the team plays for Darcy. You can get pissed off at the team for that, and maybe you should, but I think this team, and maybe this is just a dumb theory, I think this team still doesn't trust Darcy because of last year. Because everyone was saying going into the season, they gave him a nice contract where he would be our starting goaltender, get a test at it. Everyone was expecting it, and they knew we had the offensive defensive skill to make the playoffs. We just needed a solid goaltender. Darcy let down the team. And I really don't think the team liked him, in a sense, after that. And I know you might think that's crazy, you might think that's weird, but honestly, I don't see a team that plays for Darcy Kemper. So... You can put Darcy out there more and get him more snaps because he's a player who plays very well at when his confidence is high and very poor when his confidence is poor. So because we have Devin Dubnik, we're able to insert Darcy in some lineups where we feel confident with him winning, and that can improve him. But I just don't see a team playing for him like they do when they play for Devin Dubnik. So, um, And, I, I mean, going through, y yeah, I mean, we can go through his stats, Devin Dubnik, right now. I mean, he's played five games, started all five. He's been four and one. He's let up a 2.82 goals against average, which is not that good. I mean, I think we all know that. Um, I'm I'm gonna see if I have the national. Yeah, I mean the goal against average. <laughs> the carry price is one. God, the carry price is so good. Um, but I mean, the, yeah. Okay, the league average is 2.51. That would make him worse than the league average right now. So yes, he statistically wise, he is playing worse. Um, and yes, he does need to pick up his game. I agree. Devin is not... <laughs> I guess people could mistake by what I said. Devin is not playing well right now. But I still think he's the goalie we need out there to keep winning games, if that makes any sense. Um, maybe that's just because I don't know as much about hockey, but that, that's what I see with him. I see a team that plays with him. I see a team that plays off of big plays and... Devin makes big plays. Well, Darcy sits out there, and he, he can have a great game, but I, I feel like he doesn't add anything to the game. And I don't know if that's needed, but I think with this team it is, to be honest. I, I see a team in us that gets sparked by big plays, and Devin can make that big save consistently. Um, and then sh save percentage is a uh, .896, so nearly 90. So, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, he's below both league averages. We need to be honest there, but again, he's tied for second, or I guess technically tied for third, because Carey Price has six wins. Tied for third with um, Martin Jones, Henrik Lundqvist, the King, and Brian Elliott with four wins. So until we start losing games explicitly because of Devin, I can't, I can't complain. I guess, and I don't think you guys should either. And you can come and criticize me for that. I know, I know it's not a popular opinion, and I know it's not a super educated opinion, but. That's what I believe. I think we should pump the brakes on hating Devin Dubnik. Um, but now I want to jump into some guys who I think are very strong disappointments for the Wild this year. And there's two of them that I outlined specifically. Um, the first one, one you can obviously guess. I don't even know if you can call him a disappointment because we should expect it. Mr. Thomas Vanek. It's annoying because Tomics, Thomas Vanek gets points. Thomas Vanek has three goals through six games. And that would be incredibly solid. I mean, that that shows he's on pace for 41 goals. Will he score that? No way. But that's what he's on pace for. He also has an assist, so I mean, that's solid too. And he's able to play very well in the offensive zone and on the power play. That's where he can... I don't know if he has any power play goals. Um, 
Let's check here. Yes, Vanek does have one power play goal. I remember, yeah. And last night he had the... Or I guess that was... I don't know whenever you guys are going to see this video. But when we played Columbus, he had the game-winning goal. So, it's hard because he's a very good offensive player in that sense. But he, he is a lazy, lazy, lazy defensive player. I was so mad when he was out there in the 3-on-3 three -three overtime against the Kings. There was no sense that we should have played him there. We have plenty of speedier guys. We have plenty of good goal scorers that we could have put out there. And that's what you need in 3-on-3 three -three, is speed. Vanek is a lazy defender. He takes stupid penalties. He leads us with 8 penalty minutes. He has a plus-minus of negative 2. Um, and that is, I believe, tied for second worst on our team. We have Nino Niederreiter as a minus 3, which is a bit weird. But I think Nino plays on uh, Vanek's line usually. So, that, that I mean, that probably has something to do with it, to be honest. But, um, yeah, I think Vanek is just an extreme disappointment. And <sighs> I don't know what to think about Thomas Vanek, to be honest. I get pissed off at him, but then he, ma he, he scores goals that win his game. So I just think he needs to be out there in limited situations where he does have a good scoring opportunity. But otherwise, I think we have enough young and fast talent to replace him on places where he doesn't need to be. I don't think he should ever be on a penalty kill or in an overtime period. <laughs> um, and then the next disappointment that we need to outline is Jason Pominville because Jason Pominville has not been scoring goals. And a lot of this information that I'm about to talk about is taken from a, a, uh, a Jim Suan article, you know, from Star Trib. Look on, you can look it up. It's called uh, Suan Pominville's Offer Wild Fans Something to Worry About. And I completely agree. Um, I mean, again, Vanek is scoring. Koivu is playing very well. Like, <laughs> people, like, you notice how I didn't bring up Koivu in Disappointments? Because he's not. Koivu has been playing very well so far. I might be mad at him <laughs> later in the season, but he's he's a solid captain and a very good responsible defender being Koivu. He's not a franchise player anymore. But the guy that should be out there scoring goals alongside Zach Parisi and Mikhail Granlund is Jason Pominville. I mean, how uh, he's 32 years old. That means he's just entering sort of that post-prime part of his career for a lot of hockey players. And um, it says here that in his first f full season with the Wild, he had 30 goals, which I think is what he should get. Then in his second, he had 18. And now, through six games this season, he has scored zero. Now I, I realize he has assists. He has, I believe, six... Um, no, four assists. But some of those are just... It's tough to g gauge that, because some of those are passes back to Suter, who gets it into Parisi, and they're important, but he, he is a goal scorer, in my, in my opinion. I think Pominville is definitely a goal scorer, and he has not been able to do that on f with first-line ice time, or at least playing against our, playing with our two best players on our best line, and he has not been able to score, and it's, it's frustrating. So we need, to re we need a goal out of Jason Pominville soon, because his name has just not been called, and it needs to be. <laughs> that's just the way the way the guy the role he has on our team he needs to be playing better so <laughs> any anyway that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about the wild I wanted uh, our power play is very strong this year so far um, Matt Dumba has been disappointing but he's young enough where I didn't want to bring him up uh, he's young he has the talent and he'll get into his groove soon Jonas Brodeen hasn't done much but he hasn't done much wrong um, our penalty kill has been eh, not that good. And that's the issue, but our power play has been stronger. So overall, I think the Minnesota Wild are right on track where we want them to be. The only improvements, I would say, would be Pominville needs to start scoring goals. Um, Vanek needs to get less ice time, and Devin Dubnik needs to improve his performance statistically-wise so fans can realize that he is the goaltender that this team does need at this point. Also, I think Darcy should get a few starts. <laughs> Okay, now moving on to the next er, and last sort of wrap up. Oh well, okay. There, I'm I'm just gonna do a quick little overview of the Minnesota Timberwolves because it's just preseason. There's not a lot to talk about, and then I'm gonna end the show on a little fan duel analysis of my team. So, um, just from watching a few games, Andrew Wiggins has been very solid. His shooting percentage has been average, um, actually not that great. But it's preseason; you can't gauge that. He's been scoring. Um, Carl Anthony Towns is who I wanted to be ex really excited about, and he's shown in this preseason, averaging 11.7 uh, points a game and 7.4 rebounds with also a block a game thrown in there. That's what you want to see from this player, and that's what he's going to be in the NBA. Um, 
Gorgie, Gorgie Jang, I should say, has actually been one of the more surprised players. He's actually leading the team in preseason minutes, um, a game at least with 25.3, right above Ricky Rubio, um, which is interesting because then you wonder what's Nikola Pekovic's role is going to be. Is Carl Anthony Towns going to play some power forward? Is Gorgie going to play some power forward? How is that center position going to work out? Um, and, I mean, it's it's curious, but right now with Gorgie and... Uh, uh, K, Cat, I guess, can I just call him Cat? It works. Um, Carl Anthony Towns, yeah. They're a very good center combo and very exciting. Obviously, we know what Wiggins can do. If Rubio can stay healthy, this team will be solid. And then uh, the the surprise player that everyone should be talking about because he's earned playing time is, uh, I don't know how to say his first name. Is it just Nemanja? But then I looked up um, Belitsa. Or Belitsa is how it, it looks like it's Bajelica, and that's how I thought it was forever. But it's I believe he's Serbian, and so um, that's sort of how that works, I should say. Um, but he has been showing that he has a very good outside shot, and that he he also has the ability to score from mid range, pass the ball. He's been a very good overall player, and will work very well into this lineup, I should say. I guess in my opinion. Okay, so that's kind of my overview of the Timberwolves. I think they're going to be a fun team to watch. A lot of uh, young talent that we should recognize. <laughs> and, yeah, they'll be a good team. I know I only talked f about them for a couple minutes here, but um, I just wanted to do a little summary. It is only preseason. We do need to acknowledge that. Okay, moving on to the last part of this video is my quick little fan duel analysis. So... <laughs> I think there's actually a lot of interesting plays this week in FanDuel, and I'm going to go over my team and why I picked them, basically, and why you guys should pick this exact same team. And I'm not going to guarantee, but I'm going to say this is your best chance at winning money in 50-50 leagues, or I generally participate in, like, leagues that are, um, what do you want to say, like, um, there's, like, 100 people in it, and, like, the top 20 people get money, because that's how you really make money in this. And I know this is last minute. I'm going to start doing these podcasts um, earlier than Saturday night slash Sunday morning, depending on when you watch this. So you can maybe set your lineup a little bit earlier. But my first play, and I think this is the play of the week, the easiest lock of the week, Carson Palmer. Carson Palmer has been having an, a pretty, well, he's been having a great season on the field, but a sort of average fantasy season as of late with his last three games not getting over 20 points. Actually, last four games, not being out of uh, over 20 points, but before that, he was averaging above that. And he has all the skill, too. Um, with a 8.2K price tag against Baltimore, which I'm telling you, start if... I don't care what team is playing Baltimore, start that quarterback. I started Colin Kaepernick last week, and he got me the points that I needed to make money. <laughs> um, but... It, that's what I'm saying, is this Baltimore secondary is just torn up, and it's sad, because they were supposed to be a good secondary, but the team has just struggled. So Carson Palmer, 8.2K, definitely, a, a I think, my top play. Todd Gurley also has been proven. I think he's still in, like, the 6,000 range on DraftKings, but FanDuel has their shit together and are actually charging a good price for him. 7.4K is what you're going to get Gurley at against a Cleveland team that I do believe is the worst team against the run in the NFL. Gurley's going to tear him up. That team does not pass a ton. They're much more of a running game with him, and I don't know if Trey Mason still plays as much. I don't know if he's still recovering from his injury or if Gurley has just taken the spotlight. Um, I love Trey Mason, obviously, because I'm an Auburn fan, but yeah. Then Devonta Freeman has been doing everything he wanted against a Tennessee team that's average, where Atlanta will probably be up big on them. I can't see why you would not play Freeman. I know he's like one of the top running backs price-wise, but he's my big player of the week. My, uh, I think, yeah, he's the one I spent the most money on. My receivers are Martavis Bryant, who had a great game even with Landry Jones, so whether or not Roethlisberger is back, him against that Kansas City secondary must play, in my opinion. Vincent Jackson, I picked Jackson over Evans because w one of these receivers is going to go off. Washington their secondary is not that good, and they've been giving up big plays to big receivers this year. So I think Mike Evans is the more talented receiver at this point, um, and he's younger, but I just haven't seen that connection between Jameis and Evans that you'd want. It just I think he has like a few interceptions throwing his way and not that many completions. So I picked Vincent Jackson, who was also the cheaper option. Again, tall receiver, someone that uh, 
I think Jameis can trust. And then John Brown, who is questionable at this point. Um, he didn't practice Friday either, which is a little bit uh, annoying. Um, but yeah, he's going to be <laughs> the number one wide receiver. I mean, Larry Fitzgerald is going to get all the attention for Baltimore. And what little scraps Baltimore secondary has left will be covering the explosive John Brown. Play him if he plays. Otherwise, you're going to have to... I mean, because he's questionable, it's a Monday night game. You're going to have to sort of... Um, <laughs> play another guy at that level which would be like one of Baltimore's wide receivers so I don't know about that Gary Barnage has been putting up like numbers better than Rob Gronkowski recently and he's been doing it over like four weeks now so I think Gary Barnage is actually a very solid weekly play still under 6,000 um, on FanDuel and, and like that's incredible against the St. Louis defense that is okay but I can't even judge Barnage based on matchups because he was supposed to have a horrible game against Denver's great defense and Denver <laughs> gave up a lot of points to him so and then kicker is uh, Josh Brown for New York because I feel like I don't know he's been playing very well this year for a kicker and against Dallas I feel like he's going to do well um, and then the Atlanta Falcons defense is who I played just because they're playing Tennessee Zach Mettenberger is playing um, if you guys want a sneaky cheap quarterback play play Zach Mettenberger because Mettenberger has been throwing for like, he's thrown for like over 200 yards in all of his games, which I think is crazy. Now, he doesn't win a lot of games, and he makes a few mistakes, but if you want a touchdown upside type of guy with, I think he can throw for like 250 yards, two touchdowns, maybe a pick. And, yeah, I mean, I don't like Mettenberger that much, but he, he gets points in fantasy. So if you want a cheap quarterback, that's your sleeper guy. That's basically it. All right, guys, so I know this intro has been all about Minnesota Vikings this first podcast, or Minnesota sports, I should say, and there's been no guests, so it's not exactly how it's going to be laid out. But this is what you're going to start seeing is uh, mainly Minnesota sports, and we'll sprinkle in more national sports based on our guests that we bring in. So thank you guys, as always, for watching. I guess I don't have an official outro here, but make sure you check in last week. Check me out on Twitter, do all that. And I guess just until next time, uh, <laughs> I'll see you then, and go Minnesota sports.